Any questions? I just wanted to point out that um, on the Moodle web page, you will find a couple of uh, links. One is a link to YouTube. So if you have a difficulty in watching the audio and video, which is posted after each lecture, there is a lecture and then there is an audio and video that you will see here. If that doesn't play for you for some reason on your browser, then you can go into the downloading section where you can download the MP4 file directly onto portable device or on your computer and use a Windows media player uh, or watch directly on YouTube. That should also work. And uh, Rob has been kind enough to open up a local server. So if you're on the campus network and if you want a faster download, then if you go to this directory, uh, double backslash che dash server. Um, so there you will find a course directory che 7130. And on that also there is a copy of all the videos only of the lectures uh, that have been so far. So these are fairly large files, typically 100 meg or so. And that's why I'm making it available through different ways if you feel the need for it. You can download from any one of these sources. Um, the other one is uh, I posted a midterm kind of a survey just to get some feedback on what are the parts that are working for you and what are the parts that are not working for you that we should uh, kind of fine tune. So uh, if you wouldn't mind going into that and it's an anonymous uh, survey, there are just about eight or ten questions. Uh, if you fill that out, and I'll just get the numbers from there. They want to get a distribution of uh, how people are receiving different parts uh, of this uh, lecture. Okay, and uh, the third comment is about from time to time I plan to put um, additional links also. For example, there is a link here that talks about flow between parallel plates. It has some nice animation on laminar and tableau flow and stuff like that you want to get a visual picture, there is a very simple mathematical development. But more importantly, some recent papers from the literature, because this is a graduate course, so you should be able to read up papers and try to understand what, uh, what particular problem they have solved. So here I picked up a paper on flow between parallel plates, but it is a non-Newtonian fluid, and they use index notation a lot. So this will be a very nice exercise for you to make sure that you can understand the index notation in there for the stress versus rate of strain relationship and then how they solve that. So I might actually make this as part of an assignment where I ask you to critique that particular paper, act as a re reviewer for the paper and see what are the good parts, what are the bad parts and uh, get some idea on uh, understanding the math, the physical interpretation, what problem they have solved, and how significant is the problem. Things like that, comment on those. So uh, I will put periodically papers like that that are kind of related to what we are doing, but obvious extensions of what we are doing. So you can see that some of these problems, although are more than 100 years old, there are aspects of the problem that are still relatively of uh, uh, interest in the current literature. Okay. Uh, yeah. I guess this is the instructor's uh, interface. So I, I noticed the the written on the I didn't find that. You didn't find that? Yeah. I should check that one, isn't it? Uh else to do? The survey is still there, okay. so I don't know if you're not able to get it. All of you, please try it, and if you have difficulty in uh, accessing it, let me know so that I can trace where the problem is. Okay. So I constructed the survey out of uh, Google Docs, so it's basically served from Google Docs uh, 
server. And it sends me just the numbers uh, of uh, the, the response. Um, otherwise, I hope it, you will be able to access. If there are any difficulties in accessing any parts of it, please do let me know. Okay. Of course, the question is, how do you know what you're supposed to see? <laughs> right? So he here you are. This is what you're supposed to see. Um, week by week account of lectures, PDF file, and audio, and any additional material for that week, as well as assignment. You'll see assignment one, and uh, it is with the TA now, and once it's marked, I'll give that to you, and then I'll post the solution also, right below that uh, assignment. Okay, And the third assignment should be up by next, next week, or so I'll work on it on the weekend. And an exam is coming up, midterm exam, in two weeks, I believe, October 6th. Okay, so just a reminder. Any other questions, comments? All right. Um, we are going to see a lot of new mathematical techniques in the next couple of lectures. The math gets progressively uh, challenging, difficult. Not difficult, but I guess challenging. Uh, in the last lecture, let me just review it quickly. We looked at uh, two or three different kinds of problems, all rectilinear flows. Okay, And here is just a summary. The equation for flow between parallel plates, so-called Pazul flow, where the velocity field is given by one component depending on one spatial position alone. And uh, that is the problem of flow between two parallel plates. When it is driven by a pressure gradient, it's called the Poisson flow. And the equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, reduces to this particular form that you see here. And the boundary conditions are the no-slip condition at the top of the plate and at the bottom of the plate. So the plates are at a distance of 2b from each other. Okay. And we know how to solve it. We solved it and we got this velocity profile, which is a parabolic velocity profile. That's a quadratic Cx2 times x2 over 2 minus b. It satisfies both the boundary condition. It satisfies the differential equation. So it's a valid solution. And the profile looks like this with the maxima in the middle, symmetric profile. And once you get the velocity profile, we can then answer questions in terms of physical interpretation. The typical thing that we would be interested in is between pressure drop and flow rate or between forces and velocities. Okay, Here force is the pressure force and the velocity or the flow rate. And we obtain that result for flow rate between two parallel plates per unit depth perpendicular to the board. And we obtain the shear stress on the wall by, once you know the velocity profile, take the gradient of the velocity profile, plug it into the shear stress expression and you can get that expression. So in an experiment, if we can measure the shear stress or we can measure the pressure drop, or the flow rate, we can calculate visco viscosity. So a lot of viscometers exist on this principle, capillary viscometer, uh, coet viscometer, etc. Then we looked at the flow between still, still two parallel plates, the same assumption about the nature of the velocity field, one dimensional. But this is a coet flow, meaning there is no velocity, the pressure gradient. Pressure gradient is zero. So the flow is driven by a moving boundary. So the boundary velocity is u. The top plate is moving with the velocity of u. And that sets the successive uh, layers of the fluid in motion. And then you end up with a velocity profile that looks like this, a parallel, I mean, in a straight line, a linear profile. Whereas in the previous case, it was a parabolic profile. Okay, again, you should know, I do expect you to solve simple differential equations of this type in an exam. Okay. And then uh, get the shear stress versus uh, velocity relationship from that. And final example we saw in the last class was uh, Pozul flow, but in a circular pipe. So the only thing that changes conceptually is the geometry from flow between two parallel plates. We are now looking at flow between uh, a flow in a uh, circular pipe. So the geometry is like this. Once again, it is a pressure-driven flow, so there is an applied pressure gradient through the pipe, and 
the profile turns out to be again parabolic but it is axis symmetric meaning if you rotate around the center axis you will get the same profile that is if you take a cut through the pipe passing through the diameter any plane you will get the same profile whereas in the previous case you will get the same profile perpendicular to the paper at any plane you will get the same velocity profile okay, so that that we call as translationally invariant in the z direction the profile is the same whereas this is an axisymmetric flow and the terminology axisymmetric means if I take a plane like this or if I take a plane like that on any plane if I plot the velocity profile it will always be parabolic so there is no dependence on the theta direction that's why we call it as axisymmetric symmetric about the axis and that velocity profile is given here and the two boundary conditions I have summarized there and once you get the velocity profile you can get the flow rate versus pressure drop and the shear stress and we derived a result that is very familiar to you from an undergraduate physics course that friction factor is equal to 16 over Re. Um, so problems of this kind are going to be the test bed for your exams and stuff like that. Okay, so I will prepare you for that in another few assignments. Yeah, I have a question uh, yeah. related to the assignment term by the point term. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't fully understand why the pressure gradient is zero. Okay, that, that, that you need to understand the physics and then impose that condition on the equations. Okay, so in, in, the, in these problems, for example, in this case I said the top plate is moving with the velocity, so there is no applied pressure gradient. I'm not using pump to pump the fluid. Okay, uh, in the falling uh, film example, uh, I guess I have some space here. So this is a wall and that is a wall and this is water and that is air. So water of course is uh, uh, kind of overflowing from that as a wall. Okay. So what is the force that takes the liquid down? It's basically its own weight, gravity. Okay. So it is a gravity driven flow and so rho g is important but I'm not using a pump to pump it. Okay. So there is no applied pressure gradient and that is coming that understanding is coming from a physical description of the problem okay so this is a freely falling film and there is no applied pressure gradient so the, the pressure gradient term in the equation is zero but its role is taken by rho g so if you look at the equations for this square v dy square if you call this distance as y is equal to in the navier stokes equation this velocity can be driven either by a pressure gradient or by a moving wall or by gravity. These are all the forcing terms in the Navier-Stokes equation. So in this case we are saying it is equal to rho g. Okay. So if the gravity is zero of course it won't flow then the velocity will be zero everywhere. Okay. So you need an external mechanism to drive the flow and typically these three can be the such mechanism. A moving wall, gravity by itself or the applied pressure gradient. Yeah. Uh, we say there is no uh, pressure. Dynamic pressure. That's exactly. That's um, the static. Yeah, the static pressure uh, in this problem will it exist in a freely falling film? Uh, will there be a pressure buildup? The pressure buildup occurs if I have. For example, a tube and the tube is blocked by some sort of a uh, sheet at the bottom and then it is filled with water to a certain height. So if you ask the question what is the pressure at the bottom, that will be by rho g h because of the weight that is ahead of it. Okay? But the moment I release this, it, it is like being in a weightless environment. If I am going in an elevator. If somebody cuts the rope in the elevator and I'm falling, right? I'm freely falling inside that. So as far as I'm concerned, inside the elevator, I, I won't feel. It, it's as if momentarily I'm in a gravi zero gravity environment. Even though the gravity is acting on me and it is acting on the elevator, it's acting at the same rate. So I could freely 
move on till I hit the ground. <laughs> and this is how, in fact, they create zero gravity environment. I don't know whether you guys know about it. They have this uh, parabolic trajectories for in planes. So in order to simulate zero gravity environment, what they have to do is they t t take a flight, and then the trajectory will be kind of falling, okay, at the same rate as g is falling. So inside the plane, it is as if you are in a zero gravity environment, okay. So you can do experiments. So if you have a beaker of water in such a plane, as the plane is moving horizontally, it will feel gravity, and at the bottom of the uh, beaker, you will feel the pressure, the hydrostatic head. But the moment it goes into this particular trajectory where it is falling, the water will be weightless, basically. So there will be no hydrostatic head variation in that, in that kind of an accelerator, the condition. Okay? Am I making sense or not? Okay. Okay, I'm going to now talk about a problem that's very dear to me, very inspirational problem by G.I. Taylor. Okay, the famous uh, fluid analysis that I've already talked about in the video made by him, uh, I put on the uh, on the web. This was a problem that he studied in the 1920s. He was a, I guess, a fluid dynamicist you can call, but he worked on solid solid mechanics, fluid mechanics more a physicist, I guess, at uh, Cambridge, and uh, did really outstanding work on many, many fields. And his collected work is in four volumes in the library, you can go and see. And each one of the papers has opened up a new area. And this is one area, one problem that he studied. Uh, the problem is the following. It's a flow between two concentric cylinders. So the picture that you see on the right, for example, okay? So you have an inner cylinder and an outer cylinder. What's happening here? Okay. Uh, I guess it's turning into a link somehow. And there is a fluid in between the two uh, cylinders, inner and outer cylinder. Both are solid walls. And he considered the case where the inner cylinder is rotating at an angular velocity of omega 1, outer cylinder is rotating at an angular velocity of omega 2. And we need to do an idealization in all these problems. And uh, uh, just to make it tractable by analytical means, because if you do a real geometry, then it becomes impossible to study analytically. You have to go into numerical scheme. And in the 1920s, that was not possible. So, but he was a very good physicist, very good experimentalist, and a very good mathematician. So he had a combined power of both. And the problem that he studied is the following. When you put such a fluid and spin the inner one or the outer one, what does the flow profile look like? And um, the initial assumption is that it is an infinitely long cylinder. So in this direction, it is infinitely long. Why do you make that assumption? So that you don't have end effects, you don't have the boundary effects. For in an experiment, of course, when he did the experiment, he had to take a very tall cylinder. Uh, the height of the cylinder would be 40 times the gap between the two cylinders. So that you uh, eliminate what the end effects are. What do we mean by end effect? If I have uh, if I take a section, for example, and draw like this, this that's the inner cylinder. Is there, is it there? And that's the outer cylinder. So this radius is R. I and that radius is R O outer cylinder and the fluid is in between okay so if I the, the thought experiment that you need to do at this stage is to answer this question what is the velocity profile going to look like in such a cylinder what is what is driving the flow there is no externally applied pressure gradient it's a closed system from an experimental point of view I have the top part that is closed and the bottom part that is closed and I fill this with a liquid and I spin the inner one for example. Okay? When I spin the inner one, the question is what velocity components I expect to be non-zero. So in such a case, do you expect any velocity profile in the axial direction? There is no forcing term. 
in that direction. Do you expect any velocity profile in the radial direction? Remember, the only motion is the inner cylinder is rotating with an angular velocity. Okay. So the inner cylinder rotates, that means it's going to set the fluid in motion. And so there will be a V theta component. But that will change from the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder. If the inner cylinder is moving, the outer cylinder is sta 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 stationary, for example. Okay. Then uh, to fulfill the no-slip condition, the velocity will change in the radial direction. But there will be no, that there will be angular velocity, which will change in the radial direction. But there will be no axial velocity, there will be no radial velocity. That's a conjecture, that's an assumption, that's an expectation that we have. Now, if you have to tell me, because in an exam, what I will tell you is the description of the problem. Okay? And you should be able to figure out the, from that description of the problem, this statement. Only then you can go and simplify the Navier-Stokes equation and analyze, okay, what does the equation look like? What are the boundary conditions? Can I solve it? Once I solve it, can I get the stresses, velocity fields, etc. Okay? So, does everybody understand this reasoning that goes behind the highlighted part? V is zero in the radial direction. It is non-zero in the angular direction, but it changes in the radial direction. The flow is steady. Okay? And there is no change in the axial direction. Now, that assumption, will it be true if I have a top and the, uh, a boundary there? Okay, so as I approach near that, the top boundary is fixed, for example. What should the velocity be? Zero, zero right? So the V theta component should approach zero as I approach Z. So V theta will depend on not only R, but also on Z, on Z, the axial direction. As you approach the end zone. So this is an end zone. As you approach the end zone on both top and bottom side, we will find that V theta depends both on R and Z. Okay? And that in turn will create, will drive, that will be the forcing term to drive a radial component. Why? Because the fluid must slow down. So the fluid here is going faster than the fluid that is close to the edge. So that differential in velocity will cause the centrifugal force to throw out the liquid element and it will start forming vortices. So when you have an end, you'll always have some sort of a vortex flow, a circulating flow in that region. So in his analysis, he assumed the cylinder to be infinitely long so that this assumption is valid. Okay. Uh, that the assumption that we make here remains valid as long as the inf cylinder is infinitely long. And then he looked at a stability analysis. What does the stability analysis mean? It simply means if I take that particular flow and perturb it, is it going to remain the same flow or is it going to become a different flow? Okay. So uh, you are all familiar with the concept of stability? No? I'm sure you have seen this in physics and in process control, but this example might help you recall, and that is what we mean by stability. Okay? So there are a, a couple of classic examples to illustrate this idea of stability of a given state, a given solution. Okay? Uh, pictorially, you have to think of uh, three cases like this. Uh, so I have a sphere that is kept in a parabolic dish. Okay? And in one case, the dish is pointing upwards. In the other case, the dish is pointing downwards, and the sphere is here. And in the third case, the parabola is basically a, becomes a degenerate flat case. Okay? And I'm putting a, a, a spherical ball there. The question now dynamically is, if I perturb this, if I took that sphere from its equilibrium position, what do you think would happen to it? It will just oscillate for a while with a decaying oscillation and then come back to its original position. We would call that as a stable state. Okay? This that you can write down a dynamical equation, Newton's law of motion on that sphere, and then you can analyze that equation to examine whether it's going to be stable or not. Okay? So in the second case, if I take that and give it a slightest perturbation, that would be an equilibrium state. If there are no perturbations, it will, the sphere will stay there forever happily. But the slightest perturbation is going to 
take it away from there. It will roll away. It will not go back to that equilibrium. But maybe if there is another valley somewhere nearby, it might just roll over and reach this position. So a different stable equilibrium position. So we would call this as unstable. This would be a stable. And this would be a stable structure. And this one, if you take us, uh, give it a slight force, this is going to roll over and stay in its new place. Okay, it's not going to return to its original place. And we would call this as neutrally stable. The idea of stability, this is for a solid system, it also applies for fluid mechanics system. It applies in fact for any dynamical system that is written by an uh, represented by an equation. Okay, so you can look at the stability of such systems by solving for what the steady state is and then perturbing the steady state and asking the question is that steady state going to come back and we will see a little bit of these analysis procedures later on but at this stage I'm just introducing the concept of what a stability is and that is central to the laminar flow becoming turbulent flow because we asked this question already earlier when I have a pipe flow it's not uh, realized the laminar flow the parabolic profile is not realized above a Reynolds number of 2100 why because any slightest perturbation that you give will make that solution go away, drift away from that to possibly a different solution. And this particular problem that was studied by Taylor is very rich in terms of what are the other possible states that it can reach. And there are literally thousands of papers that have been published since his work, since his seminal work, and there are monographs, there are books that have appeared just on the Taylor Quick problem. Okay. It's called the taylor kuwait problem because it was studied by Taylor, but it is a kuwait flow. What is a kuwait flow? Flow driven by a moving boundary. Okay. So as I said in the last class, um, this is a good approximation of flow between parallel plates. If you make the gap between them too small, okay, you can approximate the uh, solution. Any questions? Okay. So once we come up with the proposal for the velocity field, our job is simple. We need to go to the uh, Navier-Stokes equation in cylindrical coordinates, start canceling all the terms. Okay, and I've given you the reference here of the original paper. Okay, uh, 1923. Okay, uh, so let me just give you some of the type of solutions that he found. Okay? So at very low rotational speed, and there is a number called Taylor number since then that characterizes this problem, very much like an Reynolds number. But at very low rotational speed, you will find in fact the velocity profile to be uh, given by this. That is, velocities are all pointing in the theta direction, but it is, if the inner cylinder is rotating and the outer cylinder is not, then the velocity is maximum at the inner cylinder and zero at the outer cylinder. That is called a one-dimensional flow. We are going to actually analytically solve for that because it is possible to do that. But when you perturb that solution and if the Taylor number, the rotational speed is above a critical value, you will find that solution spontaneously breaks down and goes into a new type of solution. What do you think is the mechanism that allows you to, uh, allows the flow to reach that state? It is a centrifugal force. It's a common experience that you will have when you're going in roller coaster, for example, or in any curved path, you will feel a force that's pushing you out, right? And it is the same force that will cause a fluid element that is inside, that is rotating at a higher velocity, so it has a greater centrifugal force to be thrown out radially. That is the source of the radial velocity component spontaneously forming. The question then one can ask, why doesn't it always form, no matter what the rotational speed is? So that centrifugal force must be larger than the viscous force, the damping viscous force, okay, for the flow to actually develop a radial component. And that occurs only at a critical rotational speed. And his contribution was, not only he recognized that, he showed experimentally that it occurs, and you get profiles like this. These are called Taylor cells, Taylor vortices, named after him. Okay? And at that position, at that stage, 
the velocity for profile becomes very complicated. So it will be actually all three velocity components will be present, but there will be functions of two coordinates like you see here. So this is the 1D flow, one dimensional flow that we assume, but that loses stability at a critical rotational speed giving rise to what is called a two dimensional velocity field. And he analyzed that transition and he predicted at what rotational speed that will happen and he did the experiment to confirm. Okay? And that is an enormous confidence in the Navier-Stokes equation because it is able to capture a complicated transition from a one dimensional flow to a two dimensional flow and agrees well with the experimental work. And we are not going to be able to compute, uh, or we are not going to be able to solve for this velocity profile when the flow is so complicated with kinds of cells, but we will do that computationally using ComSol. I, I might make that as one of the assignments. But we will solve the one dimensional flow, we will do that right now. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Is that uh, closest to the NSO If the inner cylinder is rotating, the outer cylinder is not. Yeah, so, I mean, how, how does it? How does the velocity profile look? Okay. Um, if this is the inner cylinder that is rotating with an angular velocity of omega 1, okay. So, what will be the radial velocity and the angular ve velocity v theta? omega 1 times r 1. r 1 is the radius. Okay. Angular velocity is so many radians per second and you multiply that by r 1 that gives you the linear velocity, so many meters per second. Okay. So the velocity here would be high and the velocity at the outer one is going to be 0. So the profile, if you want to plot it as a vector diagram will be like this. Which one? These velocities are not linear, they are angular velocities, they are the v theta component. I am just drawing one segment of that arc. Okay, they will all be pointing in the theta direction. So at every point they should be tangent to the circle that you can draw through that. Okay, any questions? Please, if there are questions on the physics you need to ask. On the picture next to the velocity profile that's color, uh, they have like the, uh, they're going in opposite directions, and I mean like one of the z-axis is in, in layers, and I'm going to go back to that. Here? Yeah. Um, well, it's, no, no, it's down below this one near the other picture. That, where you drew the green arrow, are they like going clock? clockwise in some layers on this cylinder. Ah, ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. These cells are going in counterclockwise, this neighboring cells would be. For example, here, like that, and the next one also should be moving up. Why? Because the velocity must be continuous, right? So along, along this boundary, the velocity must be continuous. So they will be pointing in the same direction. But if you go to this side, the same must come down here. And so this will also come down. So they will be kind of rotating in a counterclockwise, uh, counter rotating vertices that are arranged alternately. And his analysis was able to predict what would be the critical Taylor number at which this transition will occur and what is the spacing was able to predict what would be the size of these vortices by the stability analysis. But if you look at, if you ask a question, how does the flow field actually look like? One way of visualizing, if you have seen those videos that I have put on, is through what is called a dye injection, meaning you just put a dot of red dye, for example, at a particular point and trace what path that red dye will uh, take. So what is going to happen in this case is this red dye would want to move around this because the fluid is moving, so it's going to follow the thing. But at the same time, the fluid is also having a theta component. Okay. So I, I don't know whether all of you can imagine this. Please try. Okay. In your own mind. So this is moving in a counterclockwise direction like this, 
but at the same time it is having an angular velocity. Now in this particular case, this is the radial direction, this is the axial direction. So this is a plane that I cut through the cylinder, through the center of the axis. So I will get a rectangular region. So this is the inner cylinder and that is the outer cylinder surface. So between those sections I see these cells. In addition they are rotating in the angular velocity. So what kind of shape would that uh, dot take? Some of you are very good in 3D imagination. It, 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 it spiral would be kind of in the same plane but moving inside. I think what you mean is helical, right? The, the difference between a spiral and a helical. The helical is a spring, okay? So it will be like a spring. So it's going to follow a helical path and then come back on itself. When it goes around the 24, uh, 360 degrees, 2 pi, it will come back. So it will be something like this. Okay. But if you take a section and look at how it looks, this is how it will look. The picture on the right hand side is a section through the radius to the center of the thing. Then the cells are going to look like this. Okay. So there are all three velocity components. There is a radial component. So if you took for, for example this one, this is non-zero. That is a radial component. And in this region, this has a velocity like this. That is your axial component. And then there is an angular component. Okay. So visualization of flows is an interesting and challenging uh, topic as well, experimentally as well as uh, in computer uh, generated solutions. Here is a visualization of uh, Taylor vortices. The, Taylor did not know this because uh, he just predicted the first transition. Turns out, navier Stokes equation is so rich that there are many, many other types of solutions. One of them is called this wavy vortex. Okay? So it is still a vortex, a cellular flow, but it also has a wavy behavior. So these waves themselves will go around with a certain frequency. Okay? And experimentally, people have observed this and computationally by solving the navier stokes equation, uh, people have predicted as well. Not only those, you can also have solutions like this. These are waves that are moving in the axial direction, up and down. Whereas that is a, move, a wave that moves in the angular direction. This is a wave that moves in the axial direction, back and forth. Okay. And here you have even a more complicated visualization, three-dimensional three rendering of the wave structure. How does the wave look? These are all coming from computations, of course, now. Okay. So there are a lot of information. I've given you a reference here. Um, but let's start doing the hard work, getting the solution now. Talked about the physics, how rich, how complicated the physics can be. But now we are going to start simplifying the navier stokes equation and getting the basic one-dimensional solution. We won't even do the stability analysis now. Later on, if there is time, I will outline how that is done. So this is the starting point. So you have the momentum equation. Of course, it's a rectilinear flow, one-dimensional flow. You need directional. So continuity is automatically satisfying. So all you need to worry about is if you take the R component, it's a steady flow and there is no VR and there is no VZ. There is no VR, so that drops out. But V theta is present okay, because it is driven in a, by a moving uh, boundary in the angular direction. So that term is not zero. You have to keep that term that's present. Okay. And similarly, dpdr is the pressure gradient in the radial direction. That is not zero. So Even the first red one is because vr is zero. Right? vr is zero, correct. Yeah. And the third one? Uh, vr is zero also. Okay. So in every one of them, vr is zero. We are looking at the r momentum equation. Okay. And uh, so everywhere you will have vr equal to zero will make that drop. Now the last term here is v theta, okay? dv theta with respect to d theta. Why would that be zero? v theta is not dependent on theta, okay? So that's zero, and we're going to ignore gravity. Whenever we have a closed system, there is no free surface. We can freely neglect gravity and accommodate for it as a uh, its effect is being only in a hydrostatic uh, variation, okay? So the Theta momentum equation simplifies to 
this. Now we need to give it a physical interpretation. What does it mean? Okay. So V theta we need to still solve. V theta is an unknown at this stage, but P is also an unknown. But what this equation tells us is that there is a pressure gradient in the radial direction that is caused by centrifugal force. So the interpretation for the term on the left hand side is it is a centrifugal force, V theta square over R. Okay. So they, those two balance and because of the centrifugal force there will be an increase in the pressure in the radial direction. Okay. So those two balance. Then go to the Z momentum equation again. You will see that all of them drop out everything that has Vz and so there is no pressure change in the z direction. There is a change in the radial direction balanced by centrifugal force. There is no pressure change in the axial direction. Um, if, if you keep the cylinder vertical and if you allow for gravity there will be a gravitational static variation but there is no dynamic pressure variation in the z direction. The next thing we need to do is look at the theta equation. In the theta equation it is steady flow and remember it is rectilinear flow so magically the left hand side must all die down because it is a nonlinear term we do not want to deal with. So V r is 0, V theta is not a function of theta, V theta is not a function of z and here V r is 0. So every term on the left hand side is 0. Okay? There is no convective acceleration, there is no nonlinear term. Now, in the theta direction it is not a pressure driven flow. So there is no dp d theta as well. And if you look at the other terms we will have v theta changing with r. So that term will be present, it will not be 0. And the other term v theta is not a function of theta, v theta is not a function of z and v r is 0 and gravity we ignore. Okay? So that equation simplifies to the theta momentum equation simplifies to this subject to two boundary conditions. Okay, this is a second order equation in u theta. So we need two boundary conditions and those boundary conditions are going to be the rotational speed that is imposed on the inner and outer boundary. Now I think Taylor's work actually considers the most general case where both cylinders could be rotating independently at its own angular velocity which we choose omega 1 and omega 2. So the linear velocity u theta will be omega 1 times r 1 and u theta at r 2 will be omega 2 times r 2. Okay. So if there are any questions or issues please ask me. Okay. I am just uh, writing these two boundary conditions which are imposed from physical understanding of the problem. Now you can integrate that equation, this equation twice by simply taking the dr to the left hand side integrate once and then integrate it twice and you will get the velocity profile as u theta equals a r plus b over r. These are the two integration constants a and b. When I make that jump, how many of you are lost and would rather see me fill that gap? You guys are okay with that? I am doing this only if it is very simple uh, constant coefficient differential equation of first order, second order, third order. You should be able to do that. We are going to do much more complicated problem today I guess in separation of variables. There I will take you through all the steps. But in going from here to here all you are doing is separating and integrating twice and you should get this result. And if any of you have difficulty in getting that please come and see me afterwards. Okay? So we have an equation with two integration constants, we have two boundary conditions, plug in the boundary conditions and solve for them. So at r equal to omega 1 r 1, the I mean at r equal to r 1 the velocity is omega 1 r 1. So substitute for r equals r 1 then r equals r 2 in those places. And on the left hand side substitute omega r 1 and then omega r 2. Okay, so you have two equations in two unknowns. Unknowns are a and b which you can do solve by elimination and you get a to be equal to. No, this is a general case where both are moving at their own independent yeah, rotational speed. Yeah, the, the, this is what Taylor did in this analysis. 
let the two cylinders move at their own angular velocity. So omega one. General form, but you can always put omega one equal to zero or omega two equal to zero. Consider special situations, and I'm going to discuss those special situations pretty soon. Okay, so this is solving for the integration constant for a, and then for b. Okay, so you have the complete velocity profile now. You can pl plug back a and b, and this is your velocity field. Okay, it's not linear as you will notice. There is an r term, and there is a one over r term. What did we know? What did we learn when we looked at two parallel plates? What was the velocity profile when one plate was moving, another one was stationary? We just reviewed it this this uh, at the beginning of this lecture. It's a linear profile. Okay, so if, if this were also linear, what we need is only the first term. So why does the second term appear? One over r term. because it's in cylindrical coordinates okay the curvature effect so if you take for example this result and I ask you to mathematically show that when the gap between the two uh, inner and outer cylinders becomes extremely small this result should approach the result of flow between parallel plates okay the math is not that trivial but you can show indeed that the second term will drop out and you will get in the asymptotic limit uh, a linear profile uh, between the inner and outer cylinder. But because the curvature is strong, you get this 1 over r term. But if you make the curvature weak by taking very large radius, but the gap to be very small, then this result should go to that. So let's look at some limiting conditions. Okay, So um, what would happen if both the walls move at the same speed, omega 1 and omega 2? Okay, we can go back and look at if omega 1 is equal to omega 2, b is equal to 0. You can see that, right? b is equal to 0. And um, a is omega 1. a is the other integration constant. Okay, if you examine this, when you put omega 1 equal to omega 2, you can factor that out. And so you'll get r2 square minus r root square in the numerator, which cancels out. So this reduces to simply omega 1 or omega 2 because they are the same, right? So A1 will become that. And uh, <clears throat> from the R momentum equation, we still have this left. dP dr equals rho u theta square over R. Now that you know what u theta is, you can take this and plug it in there. So you can actually integrate that and get the pressure profile. Remember, there are two unknowns. Pressure is an unknown, and the velocity in the theta direction is an unknown for this problem. And we have two equations, the theta momentum and the R momentum. So you, you solve the theta momentum to get the velocity profile, put that velocity into the R momentum equation, and integrate that, and you get the pressure profile in this form. <clears throat> okay. So what, what does it mean physically if both the inner and the outer wall have the same angular velocity? Intuitively, without even solving this, what should you say about the velocity in between for the fluid? The outer one is moving at omega 1, the inner one is moving at omega 1. What should happen to the Will there be a velocity gradient? When I say velocity v theta component, for example, the angular velocity will be the same everywhere. It's the same outside, it's the same inside, so it is the same everywhere. The linear velocity will be simply angular velocity times r. Okay, so v theta, v theta will be simply omega times r. Omega is a constant everywhere, and that is what you would call a solid body rotation. What does that mean? If I take a solid body and put it on a rotating table, take a, I don't know whether you guys are, you're young, you don't know LP records, right? long playing records. <laughs> if you take a long playing record and put it on a tame table, that's a solid body, right? So everywhere it is rotating at 33 RPM, 
revolutions per minute, whether it's the inside or the outside. But if I put a piece of paper in the inner position, a piece of paper in the outer position, and see how far they move, the distance they will move will be equal to omega times r, the radial position. So the one that is outer, for example, if this is your circle, and I put one here and one there, they're all moving at the same angular velocity. So in a certain time, this may move this way, the other one must move longer, they're starting from here to going there. So the linear velocity v u theta will be equal to omega times r. That is what we call as a rigid body or a solid body rotation. Okay? So it is moving as if the whole fluid is a solid. There is no relative shear. That is the key point. When it is moving like a solid body rotation, there is no shear. What is shear? You must have different fluids moving at different velocity. Okay? There must be a velocity gradient. So in this case, it is moving like a rigid body rotation. Um, another limiting case, and, and in that lim uh, solid body rotation case, the pressure variation is given by this way, P0, P0 is some preference pressure at some r equal to 0, for example, plus rho omega 1 square r square over 2. Okay? There are a number of interesting problems one can look at from that particular pressure variation. Centrifuges, for example, work on that principle. Okay? When you are rotating, when you are trying to separate a solid in a centrifuge. It is a centrifugal force that separates the particles uh, when there is a de density difference from the fluid. Uh, another example limiting case is when R1 equal to 0, that is this inner cylinder reaches the axis. So the fluid is filling the entire domain from R equal to 0 from the center to the outer one. So that is the case when you have, for example, a beaker and it is filled with water initially to a certain height and then you start rotating it. And when you wait long enough, it will reach a solid body rotation state and the interface takes this shape. Can we understand why that happens from the solution to this particular problem? And the answer is yes. Okay? Because what happens is we know that the velocity distribution is given by the solid body rotation. The pressure distribution is given by P0 plus rho omega square r square over 2. So the pressure varies quadratically in the radial direction. So if I go out, the pressure at this point is going to be much higher than what it is in the center as r square, density times r square. Okay? And if it is in a gravitational field, it is a gravitational field that keeps a level initially horizontal. Okay? So that in that gravitational field, if I start spinning it, what is going to happen to this level? The pressure here will be higher, so the fluid will be pushed up. So the fluid can sustain a larger column of water as it goes into the radial position outwards because the pressure must be, for example, if the pressure here is atmosphere, okay, so if I go down here, what will be the pressure at this point? Rho g times that h, okay. So and if I go radially out, the pressure is going to be rho g h plus rho omega square r square over 2. So at the same horizontal position, the pressure is not the same. Okay, the reason that the level was horizontal in the original case was there was no pressure variation in the radial direction when there is no spinning. Okay? There is no spinning, the pressure here is rho g h, the pressure here is rho g h, there is no pressure variation, everything is consistent, static condition. Now when it is a solid body rotation, it is still kind of a static condition because there is no shear, but the pressure here is larger than rho g h by that amount, rho omega square r square over 2. And so that can sustain a larger column fluid. Okay. That's why the liquid is pushed back. Do you understand it? Because if you understand it, I'm going to pose a series of questions for you to probe. So what does the It is given by omega r. That means that if you are at a certain position here, its velocity will be equal to the rigid body angular velocity omega times that radial position. Okay, so if I want to, for example, take a cut and then look down on it and plot the velocity profile, the angular velocity profile, the angular velocity, the, sorry, the V theta component. Okay, not the angular velocity. Angular velocity is 
radians per second it's constant everywhere okay the relationship between the angular velocity and the what i call the linear velocity is omega times r so i'm plotting now what is v theta okay so the angular velocity is omega everywhere so if i take this as a reference the velocity will be what is i need to take like that that's how the velocity profile will look. There will be only a theta component, and the theta component will be larger in a linear fashion as I go outer right towards outer radius. And that would be the same for the two cylinders. In uh, in the case when the two cylinders are rotating at the same angular velocity, yes. But when they are not rotating at the same angular velocity, they are rotating at different angular velocities. There will be shear. And in that case, the solution is given by this more complicated expression, which is you see here. Okay, so here omega one and omega two are not the same. In fact, if you take this expression and put omega one equal to omega two and simplify it, you should get that particular expression omega r. Omega one omega two that drops out, and you can factor this out, and then you can cancel this because this r. Okay. So, <coughs> so uh, th this is in the uh, fully, developed. fully developed, steady, uh, infinitely long cylinder. So, whole set of assumptions there. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, uh, the two cylinder at the first, when you go. This is, yeah, that's a very good observation. When I'm starting the experiment from rest, that is, I come to the lab, the cylinders are there, and the fluid is in there, I turn the motor. Okay? It's, you will not see this velocity profile. You will, it will take a certain time before it reaches this velocity profile. So the transient analysis is something that we are going to do maybe in a few lectures, learn how to solve developing flows, the flows that are evolving in time, and then those that are evolving in space. But these are the steady flow, so in, in an experiment you need to wait for a while before it reaches this condition. Okay, so the important point I want you to do, uh, get from this analysis is that in solid body rotation the angular velocity is constant, the V theta component changes linearly, and the pressure changes quadratically in the radial direction. Consequence of this, let's just do a few thought experiments and I'll put a few examples for you and you think about it and tell me. <coughs> well, uh, the first question is already here. What is the shape of the free interface? Why is it so? If I ask you to solve for an equation for this free surface, okay, what do you think that free surface shape would be? It's a parabola. Okay. You, you should be able to derive that expression from the result that you have here. Okay, you need to convert that result into an equation that relates r to z. That's the equation for this uh, curve. Okay, this is the equation for a pressure, but imposing the fact that the pressure on the free surface is atmospheric everywhere. Using that condition, you'll be able to relate that as an equation relating r to z. So that shape is parabola. Okay. Uh, let me give you and initially they are full, they are connected. Okay? So each one is a small tube, but they are connected in this particular way. Okay? And uh, they are symmetric. My drawing is not symmetric, but assume that the axis is here. Okay. So I fill this with a liquid. So what do you expect initially? I'm not spinning it. The level should be the same in all the three one of three of the tubes. And then I start spinning about this axis. What do you think would happen? Exactly. Make sure that everybody understands that. Okay. The answer that I heard is that these two will rise up and this will fall down. Okay. That is nothing but 
trying to reach the parabolic shape. Okay, so if you connect those three eventual endpoints, you will find that they lie on the same parabola that you obtained in the previous problem. Okay, but you need to couple it with the mass balance because the level of rise must balance the decrease. The amount of material that has risen in the last two end columns should be equal to the amount by which it has decreased in the middle column. Okay. Um, it's a good question. It's a very good question. I was going to ask you that question, <laughs> but you asked me. <laughs> so let me turn it around. <laughs> okay. If I do this experiment, not this experiment, let's go back to this experiment. I do this experiment in space, zero gravity. What do you think would happen? Even at the tiniest rotational speed, there is no gravity. Only the centrifugal force is there. All the fluid elements are going to be thrown against the wall. Okay, So it's going to basically form a film on, on the wall. Okay? Now once it forms the film, as you spin faster and faster, what would happen? The pressure gradient in that will keep increasing. Okay? But if it is somehow confined by putting uh, end plates, you're not going to let it escape. Otherwise, it will just escape uh, to a lower pressure zone. Okay? So if there is no gravity, that's what is going to happen. So what would happen in this case if there is no gravity? If there is no gravity, first you cannot fill it like that and have a level. <laughs> but gravity is the one that is helping to fill it to the same level in all three. right? So if you're doing that experiment in space, you'll have a tough time filling them up. But once you suppose put, get the fluid inside and then start spinning, of course, they will all be finding themselves in the outermost tube, near the outer edge of the outermost tube. Right? Um, yeah, the middle will be empty. Right. Now, a variation on this. Uh, a tube like this. There's no middle tube. Okay, gravity is there. So we have initially two levels that are the same. And then I start spinning about middle axis. What do you think would happen? No, there are some air in that, just the liquid. Just the liquid. Just the liquid. Just the liquid. Yeah, okay. What you're saying is it won't be horizontal anymore, but it'll be like this. Right? That's true. That's all will happen. That's all will happen if the speed of rotation is low. Okay? But now think, I'm continuing to increase the speed of rotation faster and faster and faster. What should happen? Yeah, it wants to go out. right? As I increase, it wants to go out. But what happens in the middle? In the previous case, I had a nice path for it to get, out, get down and go to the side, right? But now there is nothing in the middle. It will try to rise up, but can it rise up? A new phenomena occurs at a certain critical rotational speed. Evaporation, that's, that's a keyword I'm looking for. It's called cavitation. Okay. So what happens is the pressure here is going to be the lowest. The pressure in the middle is going to be the lowest. The pressure in the outside is going to be getting higher and higher as I spin it. Okay. So if the pressure gets higher, it wants to push it higher up and up. So it's it's getting then then it's kind of creating a vacuum. It is sucking up on these two fluids. But once the pressure here drops below what pressure? the vapor pressure of that liquid. 
once the pressure on the middle point drops below the vapor pressure of the liquid, vapors will spontaneously form. This process is called cavitation in, uh, in fluid mechanics. It occurs in a number of flow situations. So when you're designing your fluid flow system, you need to make sure that pressure doesn't fall below the vapor pressure, even in pumps and stuff like that. Again, I go back to G.A. Taylor's film. I don't know how many of you have seen that phenomenon. He has a pump. He's, he's doing an experiment actually to illustrate Fazul flow in his uh, pipe. He has two diameter pipes. Shows that in one of them, the flow rate is four times the other one. Okay, and in doing that experiment, he has this pump, and as he increases the pumping capacity, you will spontaneously see bubbles appearing in there, and he just expresses in a passing that this is due to cavitation. Okay, but it's an important phenomenon that we need to understand, and cavitation can can cause havoc in equipment, because when a cavitation occurs, it creates uh, enormous stresses and local erosion can occur due to ca cavitation, okay? Um, okay, the last uh, one would be if I spin this not about a symmetric axis but asymmetrically, what do you think would happen? So the liquid will go which way? The one with the, because this will experience a greater pressure than at this point, right? So the liquid will be flowing through, flowing out through the left part. You continue to spin back. Okay. So there are a lot of variations like this. That uh, if you understand this idea, you can explain a lot of things. What what happens to long sprinklers, for example? So there is a connection to angular velocity and a pressure gradient. So you can think through a lot of these thought experiments and relate to your daily experiences. Okay, so that's rectilinear flows uh, that are steady. So far we have looked at rectilinear flows that are steady. Now we are going to and, and start exploring problems where the flow is developing from some initial state towards a steady state. Okay, And the mathematics gets difficult because we are now talking about velocity varying at least with one position but also with time. We can no longer deal with ordinary differential equations. We have to deal with partial differential equations. One of the classic problems is the so-called Stokes problem. Stokes studied this uh, very, uh, the first. And basically the problem is the following. We have an infinitely large plate and above that plate imagine that you have infinitely large fluid. So it is an idealization. Why do we do these idealizations? Only then we can get some analytical solutions. Right? So you have to consider an infinitely large horizontal plate on top of which you have infinitely large amount of liquid filling, uh, fluid filling the complete half space. So we are not interested in uh, looking at what happens below, but above that you have in this case y. y goes from 0 to infinity from the, bottom, from the plate where it is 0 all the way to infinity and x goes also from minus infinity to infinity. And z is perpendicular to the board, also goes from minus infinity to infinity. Okay. These are very difficult experiments to do, but mathematically nice problem to solve. But we get a lot of insight from that. And we can approximate that by simply taking a large enough uh, uh, experimental domain and ignoring the end effects. So in this situation, the fluid is initially at rest in this semi-infinite domain and the bottom plate is being moved at time t equal to 0 all of a sudden with the velocity u. And our job is to predict what will be the velocity profile with time. As time progresses, how will the velocity profile look? So the velocity is going to be always u, in the bottom plate. So if I take t1, 10 microseconds after Remember, the fluid above is initially stagnant, with zero velocity. So at time equal to zero, the velocity is represented by the zero line. And then at a short time afterwards, T1, the velocity profile is going to be looking like this. So it is still zero far away from the plate, but at the plate it is moving with the velocity u. Okay. And you wait for some more time, and T2 greater than T1, you will see that the velocity profile becomes like this. 
that is the momentum diffusion has penetrated through a larger and larger distance in the other direction. So all times have penetrated only up to here. A little longer time has penetrated only up uh, to there. But if you wait long enough, it will set the entire fluid about in motion. But how long? Infinitely long, because you have an infinitely long fluid. Okay? So that is the problem, the physical problem that is posed. Any questions on that? We understand what we need to do. We need to solve for Vx as a function of y and time. Okay? So the velocity, this is going to be the velocity here at one instant of time. So there is a variation in the y direction, but there is also a variation in the with respect to time. So at a different time, velocity profile will look like this. We are plotting on the same graph, but these are all, each curve is for a different time. And so we need to allow for the velocity to depend on both y and t. So we're back to the Cartesian frame. So we look at the Navier-Stokes equation and subject it to this boundary, this assumption on the velocity field. The two velocity components, vy and vz are zero, and v acts as a function of y and time. Okay. When you simplify the Navier-Stokes equation, time is not zero anymore. So you will have this term, dvx dt, the acceleration term on the left side. And I put, the, put this down, but this is going to be zero because the flow is driven by a moving boundary, not by an imposed pressure gradient. But one can also analyze an imposed pressure gradient, which is done in your book by Burstever and Wright for, for pipe flow. Okay. Um, I will ask you, I will assign that as a reading assignment, but I will do parallel plates in class for both uh, pressure driven flow and this. Okay, and then from the viscous term, you have only one term that is non-zero, which is dvx squared over dy squared. So that equation simplifies to a partial differential equation. How many of you have seen a solution to this in your undergraduate? Good. Only one person? So others have not seen a solution to No? Um, You have all taken a differential equation course, I suppose, right? But not uh, nothing to do with PDEs. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to explain the underlying ideas in solving PDEs of this type. Um, if I need to go slow, if I need to explain, just stop me and ask. Okay. Um, this is called a parabolic partial differential equation. There are many classifications of uh, uh, partial differential equations. It's an evolutionary equation. It evolves in time. Okay? It's not important that you understand the terminologies of the theories, but you understand how to get from the Navier-Stokes equation to this, and identifying that equation, identify how many boundary and initial conditions you need. And then, in an exam, I will help you through solving this. Once you get the solution, you should be able to analyze and interpret it. And when I say and uh, help you through, I'll give you some key steps. Take this and show it to be this and show it to be that. So kind of walk you through uh, filling a few intermediate steps. So this is an equation. It's called a PDE, as I said, a par parabolic partial differential equation. What is the highest order term in the space variable y? 2. So you need, when you integrate it, typically a second order equation will give you two boundary conditions. So you need two boundary conditions to evaluate them. It is first order in time. So you need one condition and that is typically called the initial condition. So the IC stands for the initial condition and BC1 and BC2 are the two boundary conditions. Now these we write down from the physical description of the problem. The physical description that we have given so far is that the fluid initially is at rest. That means the velocity Vx for all y, the entire length at t equal to 0 is 0. The velocity is zero. The fluid is at rest. Okay. Then the boundary condition one is the velocity at y equal to zero. That is at the bottom plate for all time. That plate is moving at a constant velocity, and that velocity is u. That's also described in the problem. Okay. And then this is given in an asymptotic way. That is, as y goes to infinity for all time, the fluid is at rest. 
that is a fluid far away from the plate at infinity is always at rest. Okay? And so there are two boundary conditions and one initial condition. So we need to be able to figure out a method for solving this. This problem is done in Burstewitt and Lightfoot. And I've taken basically the material from there. Okay? So how do we go about it? One of the things that you should learn in this course is certain classic methods that are used for solving uh, PDEs. One is called the similarity transformation. So this problem is going to introduce what similarity transformation is and how you can detect that a similarity transformation solution is possible in a given problem. And I'll give you a few other examples where you will be asked to develop your own similarity transformation. Here we are going to develop it. Now what does similarity transformation mean? It simply means from a physical point of view that I can express the velocity profile in terms of self-similar solutions. That is the solutions all look very similar to each other. If you look at these two curves, they look very similar to each other except if I take this and pull it, I'll get the other graph. So it is as if a simple transformation will give me all the curves from a single master curve. Okay? from a single solution, from a single master curve, I should be able to generate the series of curves at various times. Okay? When do I know that such a so approach is feasible? Typically the signature for that is you have infinite domains. You don't have a natural length scale. In this problem, there is a natural, what do you mean by length scale and velocity scale? Here u is the velocity, so the pro no, ma no matter where I am, the velocity should be of the order of u. So we will call u as a given known scale factor. Okay? So we can scale the velocity with respect to u. But there is no natural length. The, the, if, for example, in a pipe, radius of the pipe is a natural length, or the length of the pipe. Okay? Um, in uh, quart flow in cylinders, r2 minus r1, the gap, could be used as a natural length. But in this case, whichever direction I go, it's always infinite. In the vertical direction, in the two horizontal directions. So there is no natural length scale. When you see such a thing in a problem description, that should be the first trigger to say that I must be able to get a similarity transformation. I must be able to get a master curve with self-similar solutions. And mathematically what it means is I should be able to combine the two independent variables, T and Y, into a single independent variable. And that is called the transformation, similarity transformation. It's a transformation of the two variables into a single variable. If I do that, what will I achieve with this differential equation? This differential equation has two independent variables, right? T and Y. If I'm able to combine the two into a single independent variable, I'll convert this into an ordinary differential equation. The trick to solving partial differential equations, no matter what method is, is always to convert them into an ODE, because we know how to solve ODEs. Okay? So there is no magic to solving PDEs in that sense. There is no whole class of methods, but one st additional step that we need to figure out to convert this into a set of ordinary differential equations. And then we will use the ODE theory to solve the uh, problem. So the key is to now combine these two variables into a single variable and convert the equation into a single ordinary differential equation. How do we do that? First, I'm going to define dimensionless variables, okay? So I'm going to define, for example, that V tilde, V with the squiggly above, as a dimensionless velocity variable, which is Vx, the dimensional one, meter per second, divided by U, the scale factor. Why do I do that? If I do that, what is the velocity of the plate in terms of the dimensionless variable is 1. Okay. So I'm scaling all of them to be of order 1. Okay. This is a dimensional analysis that you should routinely get used to. Uh, to keep all the numbers of order 1 so that you can have balanced terms. So that's the reason why we define this dimensionless variable. Okay. And when you do that, um, let me do this. The original one is dvx dt equals nu d square vx dy square. But in here I have defined vx tilde as equal to vx divided by nu. So vx is equal to 
vx tilde multiplied by u. That is my definition for the dimensionless variable. So I can take this quantity and plug it in there. Okay. Then what I will get is dvx tilde dt u times d squared minus tilde dy squared. I will get a u on both sides, but the u will cancel out from the original equation. From the original equation, we get the dimensionless form of the equation. Still, it's dimensionless only in the velocity. T and y still have units. Okay, T has the units of second, y has the units of uh, meter. And when I do that, of course, you'll notice that the velocity, dimensionless velocity still is zero uh, at initially. And the dimensionless velocity now becomes one at the plane because Vx over u is one. Vx is equal to u at the plane. And then here, uh, far away, it's still zero. So we have made the transformation into dimensionless variables. So what can you say about the combination of t, mu, and y square? If I can combine, if I can define a variable that has these three units, uh, these three variables, t, y square, and mu, they should also be dimensionless because the equation must be consistent. If I made u to be dimensionless, then I can combine the remaining three into a dimensionless number. Okay? That is the second clue that we have on how to combine these. First, we know that notice that there is no characteristic length scale, so it's possible to combine these independent variables into a single variable through a similarity transformation. So we explore that idea and now we know we need to work on combining t and y square and mu. In such a way, I get a similarity transformation. Okay? And uh, so you can do this in one of two ways. One is, as I said here, this is dimensionless. So that is a function of t, y, and u. So I should be able to combine these into a dimensionless variable. Okay? You can use the Buckingham Pi theorem. Do you remember what it is? Have you seen that? Putting a number of variables into dimensionless groups. Okay? Buckingham Pi theorem. You can use that method. Or there is another method. I will put a copy of a paper that illustrates uh, an alternate approach. The alternate approach is, maybe I'll just write it down for you. Define a new variable eta as t to the power alpha, y to the power beta nu. Let alpha and beta be some unknown numbers. And so now, once you have defined this variable, new variable eta, as a combination of t and y, can take that, plug it back into this equation using chain rule and I try to express it only in terms of eta. And then you'll be able to find out what should be the value of alpha and beta so that you can cancel t and y from that equation. And I'm going to put a paper for you to read on elaborating the particular method. But in here, as he does in Burst, Stewart and Lightfoot, I'll just give you the similarity transformation. The similarity transformation is eta equals y divided by 2 times square root of mu t. Okay. So in this particular case, it turns out that beta is 1 and alpha is minus 1 half. Okay. So it's uh, in the denominator, square root of t. I think we are out of time, isn't it? So we, we will continue from this point. So this is the similarity transformation. We are going to take this and convert that PDE into an ODE and then get a solution out of that.